ました。はい、お願いします。ちょっと調べさせてください。Did you guys start off by saying your name and then? I guess we're already starting. Um, start off your name and who you are. Just speak a little bit. Uh, we'll start with uh, we'll start with who you are, Grandpa, and we'll we'll then answer some questions. Okay. So, you want to introduce me or do I? You introduce. I'm Jack Gilbert. Um, I've been a retired Army Warrant Officer for, I've been retired for some 35 years now. And um, I've lived in this area for the past 30 years at least. And anyway, it's a nice country to be with, and I enjoy my retirement. And uh, my family's all around me now. And so it makes it nice. You know, nice here. Do you have any questions?、Uh, yes. What did you do prior to joining the service? I'm sorry. Like, what were you doing before you joined the service? Oh, what I went. Well, I did another thing. I generally as a young man, I worked on a dairy farm, and、uh, so I was used to getting up early and working late, and then, and I, I really liked that. I think I had fun. Then I、uh, just before I get in service, I was I had to go up to Lockport, where I was with my home at that time, and I got a job in feed company, and it, it was you, know, you sell a bag of feed, and then you got to tote it out. I was in pretty good shape, toting feed, 100 pound feed bags, and then、uh, I kept thinking, well, I'd like to go into service, and then finally I did. I enlisted, but that that, that spoiled one of my training. The、uh, Going and getting a job at the feed company because、uh, a lot of a lot of heavy work.、Uh, what inspired you to join the military? I'm sorry. What inspired you to go in the military? Well, I, I really wanted to. I guess I've been thought of it all my life, being raised during World War Two. You know, it's sort of a、uh, glory thing. You know, to see these guys. Of course, when we were kids, we played.、Uh, you know, soldier all the time. You know, and. and Had a good time, and I finally was eighteen. I, I decided, well, I really would like to go. And there really wasn't much future in the feed company. I mean, I did I later learned to tie tow two bags, but I, I wasn't looking forward to that. So I enlisted in、uh, July twenty ninth, nineteen forty nine. I was eighteen years old at the time. Did you have like any buddies of yours that were going to enlist with you? Do you have any like? Friends that were going to enlist with you, so you guys have a friend in there. Yeah, friends from that time. Well, I mean, like people who who were enlisting also, that you knew, like a like a friend who's gonna enlist with you, so you can go through like basic together or something. I met met a lot of them in, in the service. Is that the main?、Uh, it's private, right? There's so many in our area. After I left, I found that they're all practically neighbors, you know, in Buffalo and. Uh, Niagara Falls, and, and, and of course Lockport's the western part of the state, anyway. And、uh, we got got pretty close in basic, and basic was a special time.、Well, how was basic, Grandpa? Actually, I thought basic was terrible, but as I look back on it, it it, it was the、uh, best time of my whole career, and it was the only time that I knew what was go- was going on. Because they had training schedules, and they did follow training schedules right to the letter, and、uh, and they got in good physical shape. I think I, I think it's probably a better physical shape when I got out of basic than I ever been or ever was. But by the same token, during the work and, and as a farmer and a, a feed clerk salesman, I、uh, I was able to lift lift things and walk. We went on a 20-mile hike, and I, I used to do that all the time when I was hunting. I never got anything. I kept walking too fast, but、uh, I think that helped me. And, and everybody is moaning. I'm sitting there. And I don't know what they're moaning about. You know, just an old country boy here walking up, walking up and down the hills with them and helping them. And I, more than once, I carried another pack sack for a guy because he, he he really tired out. It, it's kind of a It was a、uh, rigorous training, and we 
had 14 weeks of it. And uh, that was uh, July, August, September, and October. And it was really about the best time of the year to go to have basic. It wasn't too hot and too cold. And, a lot of, and I learned a lot of skills in basic, which I didn't realize that I'm using today. Um, why, where exactly did you go when you came fresh out of boot? What kept me going? Well, what, what, where did you go when you came out of boot camp? Where did you go when you came out of basic? Did you like go straight into uh, a wartime situation? What training I did? Where did you, after you finished board, how about, what, then were you, were, where were you assigned? Your first assignment after Oh, no, I went to Fort Dix. Okay. That's very good training. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, right. I had a little trouble hearing. I, I got that from the service, too, at the moment I know. But anyway, uh, I took basic training in Fort Dix, New Jersey, and thought it was quite a lot of sand, but it really warm in August, but uh, it's a kind of a neat post. I believe it's closed now, but it's about 14 weeks. We had to stay there six weeks before we could get a weekend pass. And, and so they, they, they treated you a lot different then it, than they, they do now in basic. Grandpa, what was the atomic bomb test in your took ATOL MI? What was the bomb test? You did it, it in it, in it we took ATOL, am I? What was the bomb test you were, er, for your first I can't hear you, What was the bomb test you did in your theater? And then have we talked, the bomb test? Oh, the atomic bomb, okay. Yes. Uh, well, it was a port, uh, start out there at Fort Dix. We, uh, Basic, and then when I enlisted, I, I enlisted in the engineers because I thought, well, I could learn to operate a bulldozer or a crane or something. So at the end of my three years, I have a, have a craft. Well, it so happened I went into Messing Center, and that was an easy job. I liked that, so I didn't bother worrying about a craft. And we were shipped to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, assembled, and the 79th Engineer Construction Battalion was uh, just being organized. And, and we filled it up. And we stayed there from October to uh, January, and then we went to Oakland, and then we shipped out there in a week up. And uh, what our, our job was to build uh, bigger airfields and uh, uh, mess facilities and clubs and uh, and some buildings out there, and, and we spent, I believe, 10 months there, and we were supposed to rotate home after that, but then the Korean War broke out, but what we, we were doing there, we were working on, back to Anna we uh, we it was kind of unique, you know, on a tropical island, and we had had old war two uh, bridges, you know, right, right to uh, the weather bridge with their big legs on them, and then they come down at the knees, all real tight. It, I can't describe them except they're an abomination. But anyway, they cut the legs off them for us, and they got the, some old, old shirts from probably World War One. Do cut the arm sleeves off them, and then we had tough helmets. That, that was our uniform, and uh, so and. So we, we, we didn't get into the actual bomb test, but we were there building the facilities and we had people go over on Angebe Island, which is no more, uh, to build a tower, and then that's where they exploded the hydrogen bomb from. And they, they short one island now out there. Uh, we, uh, and then we went to Japan, and that was a little cooler. We had, and then we were going to North Korea, and so we really had to get acclimated a little bit to the cold weather. And we, there we uh, got our equipment, and we had the rifle range to get uh, proficient in our weapon. And, and as I say, it, it was, uh, that was an interesting time. But we really didn't know what you were going to do next. You said you went to uh, Japan. 
Now, uh, what exactly did you do over there other than, you know, get your equipment and, you know, shoot your rifle? Did, did they, like, give you another skill or, like, uh, assign you to, like, a different unit? What did you do when you got to Japan besides oh, getting Japan. your stuff? Well, got in trouble mostly. Uh, <laughs> as an example, um, the uh, you know, local entertainment, we, uh, we enjoyed the sake, and I was very fond of the Japanese rice beer, excuse me. And, uh, and, we, and of course we saw some sites that we hadn't seen before in Japan, and uh, we used to go to these little, I guess you'd call them cafes, and you'd come in, take your shoes off, and climb up a little platform, sit down and eat. And they said, you know, the cuisine is different in Japan, and so the only safe thing for you to order is eggs and rice, you know, fried eggs and rice. And well, that sounds good, so we'd go there, and I ordered them, me and my buddy, and this other guy come in, and he sits down, and then pretty soon they bring them out, a squid, I believe we would call it, about that long, and he's cut the tail up with a chopstick, so he's really going to town with it, and I'm going to town with my eggs, and I keep having to look at it, see, and I wonder he's gonna, how you're going to do with the tentacles. And I'm floating my mouth up, and I look, and he had the head of the squid in his mouth, and the tentacles were like, I mm -hmm, just like it was spaghetti. <laughs> and I said, I looked, I was really fascinated, and he wanted to eat that squid, but uh, I... That was my experience. I decided I didn't want to quit. <laughs> <laughs> Grandpa, what was the Nike Ajax missile? The Nike Ajax? Nike Ajax. Okay, uh, let me back up a little bit. After I left Korea, <clears throat> I went back to Fort Banks and, and as a center clerk. And uh, I just re-enlisted. Uh, but it really what happened, I needed tires for my car. And I had to go for the big bonus so I get tires. I got $360 for a six-year enlistment, less 70-some dollars for tax. But I just let me enlist enough for four new tires of my, my, my car that I was my pride and joy. I didn't have anything else left. And then I decided, well, I better uh, do something about this. I don't want to stay here. And so I applied for the uh, guided missile school. And it, at that time, it was the Nike Ajax. And we uh, went to school for eight, nine, ten months down in Fort Bliss. It was a long course, really. And then, and then we uh, got assigned to Ajax. The Ajax was the first surface-to-air missile that was, you could put in the field. And uh, it, was, it was very reliable when everything worked fine. I mean, target 35, 40 miles out. I mean, you can just hit them right on the nose with it, you know. And, and I, was a, I was a fire control mechanic. And this meant keeping the equipment. And, of course, most of the equipment was vacuum tubes at the time. And the vacuum tubes only seemed to have a habit of going out, like when they push the fire button, you shoot a missile down, something goes wrong, you know. <laughs> but... They, they were, they were, uh, they operated about 80% of the time, and, and we had a, a good time on, out in a greater range there. And uh, it, it was, uh, as I say, it, it was a forerunner of the Nike Hercules. When we were, <coughs> and then about three years later, the Nike Hercules came in, which was, was a better missile and, and uh, more reliable. And, uh, Quite a few of it was transistorized, but not all. But it's enough to keep it reliable, and that, that was sort of a pleasure to work with after the Ajax. And uh, we, we we'd have our downtime, but we could always fix it real fast because you know just so much to go bad with it. And so we every year we would go down to a Gregory Range, which is in New Mexico, and then we would fire our missiles. Red Canyon, well, another name for it. And we had to fire three missiles, and then we, they hit, by then we'd go home. 
the past. Uh, it was always in a kind of enjoyable down there. They had a, the Red McGregor reminds me, they had a donkey, one of these burrows. And uh, he, he was a, he was a character, the guys would give him beer, you know, and put beer in his mouth, and he'd put his head up, and he'd go, oh, 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 down, and he'd take the bottle back, and, and we, <laughs> we'd come back from working on a bait on the range, and, and here he is, he's poor donkey swaying back and forth. And all of a sudden, he said, a shine to my buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and he come up and run him up. And my buddy takes off, and at last I saw the two of them running around the tent area, she's trying to, open the door, open the door. He, he couldn't find his tent where he's supposed to be, and he, he's running around. And finally, I got to, got to my tent, and I said, come on here, come in here. And so we hid in there for a while. I hid him. And then we peeked out and saw nothing. You know, he, he's gone. So he just, I'll go over to He gets halfway across the quarter, and we get to the, here comes the donkey again. <laughs> and away they go. <laughs> I, went to, I went to bed. <laughs> but there's some, there was humorous things. Did. Grandpa, what did Nike stand for? What was Nike? Nike? Well, what was it? What was it? What was I Nike? What did it stand for? Nike, is, is that what you're asking? Yes. It actually was named after the Greek, Greek goddess of victory. And that's where they got their inspiration from. Both of them, one was Nike Hercules, the other was Nike Ajax, but they still kept the name. So. Uh, Grandpa, what was a chief warrant officer? A chief warrant officer is a, a, not a commissioned officer. He wasn't a, a, an NCO, like a sergeant or a corporal. But he was sort of a specialized rank. He was, he was more on the technical side of promotion. And, uh, it, he started out at W1, and uh, I don't have that. Okay, at W1, and then uh, as I, I didn't go for board. Actually, I was a sergeant at the time, and I, and I couldn't get promoted because all this so the only way I could get promoted was to go to war officer, which I did. And uh, so this is in Fort uh, in Edgeworth, Maryland. And uh, we, we uh, there's a chemical lab right there. You know, each base is sort of specialized. Fort Belvoir, the engineers, uh, Fort Sill, the field artillery, Fort Bliss, the, the aircraft, so forth. And this was the uh, chemical they worked with poison gases and noxious. So that's where I got my, my war officer and I was assigned to an office in New Jersey, and W-1. And so, as I say, you weren't a commissioned officer, but they, they, they wanted you around, a, you pulled uh, your duty officer, same as the rest, and uh, you were treated like a commissioned officer. You, I ended up several times in charge of the platoon as a platoon leader, which is a Lieutenant's job because of the office shortage. And uh, it, was, it was an interesting, it's interesting. They sort of don't know what to do with you, and uh, yet uh, they expect you to do everything. And uh, we, we, we finally got, in the, got around where we knew what we were doing mostly. And uh, so, anyway, I uh, was a warrant officer. For the, I was only in the Army about six years before I got warrant officer, which is kind of unheard of, you know, they, and so I, I did, I uh, applied for it, got it, and then uh, went to, as I say, I was assigned to um, a battery in uh, Hazlitt, New Jersey, and my main office headquarters was at Sandy Hook, New Jersey, and so I went right there, and this is a, a W-2 uh, rank. And then there's a warrant officer symbol on the hat. Well, like, like on the picture there, you have it. And uh, 
see that a little bit different. And Oster had the, the wings and the bigger symbol, and then he has his branch of service, the field artillery engineers or something here. And uh, one office all work, whether they work in the Adjutant General's office or, or a mechanic or stuff like that. At least that's, their sim that's what they wear anyway. So, and then, uh, as I say, it's sort of a, sort of a technical rank, and you, you expect to know the ins and outs of your equipment. And so, and so that, was, that was good. You said that, uh, that as a sergeant, you couldn't get promoted. Why was that? Like, why did you have to apply for a warrant officer to get a promoted? Uh, why did it take a warrant officer to get promoted? Yeah. Why did it? Why did you have to go to be a, a warrant officer if you wanted to be promoted? Because you said as a sergeant you can be yeah, promoted. Yeah. Okay. Well, I say the reason I couldn't get promoted as a sergeant, they have what they call a table of organization and equipment, and they got all these little slots, and then uh, the slots that I get promoted in. They were using it at the time to, if they want somebody promoted, they give them that military occupational special MOS numbers, and you get promoted and you go someplace else, and every time that it was open, they had to put somebody in it. And uh, so, and I said, well, the lieutenant said, why don't you try for an officer? You know, they're going to play around with us for a while. I said, okay. So I did, and I got it, and I, so... Normally you have to go to sergeant, sergeant first, last master sergeant, and then, then you jump off into the thing. But I was, <coughs> I was qualified as a mechanic, and uh, and, war, and so when I took the board, it was really easy. Everybody, our officers did it, and they, they told me some questions they might ask me, and I, I was able to answer them. Grandpa, what was your duty in Korea? Well, I was a message center clerk, and most of the time I was sent uh, driving a jeep, going back to the headquarters and getting the, the dispatches and mail and stuff, and then bringing it back to the battery. Sometimes it was a 50, 60 mile trip over dirt roads every day. And uh, it was, was kind of hairy because in, in the area we were at, we still had a uh, potential for guerrilla activity. So we had to watch them, and then we couldn't, didn't drive at night, you know, unless we absolutely had to. And uh, so uh, I bring that stuff back and then break it down and distribute it to the four batteries that belong to it. And I go back and get ready for the next day. Did you uh, do anything else other than, you know, just driving around and getting the. Well, yeah, I, I, I sort of. I say that mostly inside as clerk, and I'd have to take the dispatches and stuff and route them, and then log them in, route them, and, and uh, everybody wanted to make sure that message was that we sent out was logged just so they could have proof that it went. And then uh, other times that's about it. And, and sometimes when you run out of stuff to do, we, we'd run off and take the jeep and go sightseeing, you know. We'll go, we're going to Moonjung and get some, on a run, okay, so we go, well, side roads to Moonjung sometimes, or, which is a dumb thing to do. <laughs> we didn't think of it at that time, but we... Grandpa, what was the second off offense of the Chinese army? Well, when we were up in uh, North Korea, when we landed, the Chinese first, they first came over during the Christmas season. And we were trapped at uh, Hung Nam, and then they, we set up a rebel depot for the other people, and uh, so instead of start fighting our way out, we evacuated. And then uh, as they come down, we make the perimeter smaller and smaller. And then we had the uh, responsibility of setting up a rebel depot, which what we did was give them a hot meal and a place to sleep, and then they'd be load them on a ship, and then they'd take out. And in doing this, we were one of the last ones left off that left there. And, of course, the engineers had rigged everything with explosives by that time, and as we were going out, boom, boom, something would go down, and we'd, and, 
finally we got out of the harbor and then they blew up the whole port. And I didn't realize they had that much TNT to use. Boy, what a racket that made. And they did a nice job destroying it. And uh, we had a LST, and this is what we came back in. It was a, some, supposed to be a landing craft, but we were using it to haul our equipment. And we did. We took everything out that we brought in. And most people did. And of course, what we couldn't do, we, they, they destroyed. And what was another incident, I remember we were sitting up on deck, and there's three houses out there, and, and uh, we saw some little splashes out in the water. And it was, it was uh, right behind the in the houses, they had the artillery set up, you know, they're trying to get us. And then the Navy started firing, they fired three shots, one house, two house, three house, and just boom, 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 and they just exploded from those guns. And they, they were really accurate. I was just impressed. <laughs> <coughs> Where did you go after uh, everybody evacuated? Well, we, we came south to the little town of Olsen, a little cove there, and then we had got on our trucks, and then we had to go north to, I think, the, I can't remember the name of the town, but anyway, it was a, uh, it was quite a long ride, and I remember well, we were sitting in the back of those vehicles, and they piled us on, you know, they piled us on everything. We were riding on top of mess tent or something like that, you know, and just, just a good place to hang on to them. Boy, when we got up, we had our goggles down, and we Look out, and you know, we see this white guy, and then he pulled out the goggles, and, uh, and then he had some complexion around his eyes. It looked weird, but it, the dust was awful thick. Grandpa, uh, for your branch or class, what does AEA stand for? I'm sorry. U.S. Army, USAR, AEA. What does the AEA stand for? For class. What does AEA stand for in your class? I, and I don't understand. ADA. What does this stand for? ADA. ADA? Yes. Where'd you see it? I don't know. Yeah, the first one, the Army and the U.S. Army Reserve. No, I really don't know what he is his word. I'm sorry. It's all right. What did you do as a part of the uh, Army of Occupation? Okay. Well, actually, really, nothing. Uh, we, we were, when we went to Japan, uh, as I said, we, we were getting uh, outfitted and acclimated to cold weather and doing some rifle training with our rifles and going to the range, and that's about all. It, we were there, we only had to be there 30 days, and I think they were, we were there about six weeks. And that, that's one of the reasons we, um, that's how I got the Army of Occupation Medal for Japan. Grandpa, what did you do in Alaska? What, what were you assigned in Alaska? What was your duty in, in Alaska? Alaska? Yes. Well, Alaska was an experience. That was fantastic. Uh, they had a concept up there. Uh, you could play in the summer, but in the winter you have to train. Well, being in the uh, Nike Hercules, we, we did everything here. Same thing all day in and day out anyway, so it didn't matter to us. But we did take advantage. The leaves were very liberal in the summertime. Of course, in wintertime, you didn't, where would you go? Outside and watch the snow fall, I guess. But anyway, they, uh, we had uh, three years up there, and uh, and kids, my wife and kids loved it. They, they skied and everything else, and there's a lot of, lot of interesting stories up there. And the moose was probably the biggest character of all, you know. And uh, we went on a ski slope, the, the big town moose was sort of wandering across the face of the ski slope. And normally you, you don't bother them. You, you leave them alone. So one guy really smart, you know, he comes down there. 
He went right down the hill, and he, and he went by, he jabbed her with his feet and all. And then he turned around down the hill and looked back, and here she is. She's right behind him. <laughs> and, and, he, and he's, he's pumping his skis, trying to get going faster, and she's right behind her. She's mad. And they, they, he hit the bottom, and he just sort of slows down, and he knew he wasn't going to make it. But by the time the other guy is at the, the, uh, the chalet there, this, where the ski, and they come out and up chase her away. But he would have, he would have been mid speed. <laughs> she was mad. <laughs> Grandpa, what was your state side assignment? Hmm? What was your state side assignment? What was the state like? What was your state side assignment? When we came back from Alaska. <coughs> Well, I picked the, I picked the same uh, climate. I, I have to be stationed in Lowry, Maine, which is northern Maine, which everybody thought I was nuts, but we enjoyed the cold weather at the time. And uh, so we went there, and I, I got there. They had two units instead of four, so we were doing pretty good, and uh, it was easy there, except that commanding officer of the battalion, he only, since he only had two batteries, he could feed down there most of the time anyway. And uh, we got there in November, and then they closed the base around March, and so in May we were, we were back, headed for uh, Fort Totten. Now, now, you have to remember, Maine is way out in the country. I mean, you know, potato farmers, and that's, that's about all it is. Kind of unique. We did find out what the potato farmers do in the wintertime. They really play, and that's what when we were there. The snowmobiles, I guess, were just coming out, and they were all French descent, and they take off. and They asked if they could go between our houses. Went, so yeah, I'll go ahead. And then they take off about nine o'clock in the evening, and then about three, four, and four, and here they come back again. Singing in French and having a good time, and woo! And then they got the machine wide open, roaring through there. <laughs> I, I got a kick out of it. But anyway, that's what they did in wintertime. But anyway, we went to Flushing, and that's right, they'll say, in New York City. Oh, that was the worst place I ever been. Yeah, traffic was bearable. I got just like them. I, could, I couldn't say that. I couldn't be decent anyway. Grumble and grouch and everything else. And what was the most thrilling thing you did in the service? I what was the most fun thing you did in the service? Or what was the fu most fun thing you enjoyed while being in the Army? What, what did you enjoy the most? Well, the biggest experience. What did you enjoy? While you're in the service, what was, what'd you have that was fun? What we have at uh, Fort Totten or what? What'd you, I'm sorry, I, I'm not, I can't hear you. What did you enjoy most while being in the service? What they do most? What did you enjoy most? Oh, what I enjoy most, okay. Uh, I think the last, the tour in Alaska was most enjoyable. And it, they, you had a pretty well uh, open, Schedule, you know, and this summer we went fishing and, and uh, take the kids fishing, and we could, and they catch salmon about yay big, you know. And uh, we come back to the States, and I took Andy fishing, your, your dad, and he, was, he caught a perch. Now, that perch that long, yellow perch, is a very nice catch. And he looks at it, he goes, oh, kind of small, boom, threw it overboard. <laughs> and I had, to, I had to teach him to get out. <laughs> What we're fishing for down here. <laughs> what was the, the biggest experience for you, like while in the army? Like biggest experience. Mm -hmm. I think the overall experience. Uh, there's a certain amount of friendship. You're almost instant friends because you didn't know that they're going to be gone tomorrow and you're going to be gone tomorrow. So. so you accept everybody at face value and, and enjoyed them, and which is uh, kind of nice. And I, I 
I think the compared, uh, companionship and, and uh, of everybody. I mean, I think they, they stuck together too. I mean, if you needed help, they were right there to help you. And uh, I think that was the biggest experience. You stated that uh, that you found your your wife's job as a stay-at-home mom, you know, truly remarkable. Could you elaborate on that? Like, why did you why did you see your wife's job as a, a woman during wartime or in the what job I had the long time? No, how did how why did you see your your wife as such a remarkable oh, well, figure? I, well, I had my, we've known each other for a, a few years. We've been married over 52 years now. And I, I really wouldn't have made it to 20 years if it hadn't been for her. And uh, uh, Army, or I'll say service wives, like it. Because you, you do need the support. I mean, you're the, supposed to be the big honcho and stuff like that. You, you do need that support, especially if you're going out in the field or being a science of life. You know you don't have to worry about the, the children or, or her. She, have a broken step, she'd go out and fix it. And uh, bills, she paid all the bills. And so it was, uh, as I say, I, I had to give her 100% credit for everything. I, when I w went to work, I didn't have to worry about anything at home. I knew she was going to take care of it. So, uh, Reba Reggie, yeah. So I really, I, I just summed it up. I just had a, a good time in the military and I, I find myself now getting more, getting getting more memories of it, and I didn't save too much for my military career. Right. Sir, you said earlier how you did not really like New York City as an assignment. Could you please elaborate on why you didn't like that city? Why you didn't like New York? Okay. You said earlier how you didn't like New York City as an assignment. Oh, I didn't like New York City? Yes, sir. I, I think it's the uh, environment, really. On, on Fort Totten, we were sort of isolated from the city, but when you go out the gate, you ran into traffic, and, and uh, I mean, you sort of, you, you had to drive offensively in order to be, do something. And, and, of course, I was just getting out of Maine where you went up and down country roads at will. And you come out there, and there's all that traffic here, and you had to fight to get in and in the off the post. And, and the only way you could get any place, you had to pay tolls to get over a bridge or something like that. But we were willing to pay that. And every weekend at that time, I had a, a truck with a camper on the back. And uh, Friday night, my wife would have it all loaded up. I'd come in, change my clothes, jump in the truck, and we go off to upstate New York someplace and stay the weekend. And I, that was. We really enjoyed that. That was great. But it, we found a, when you found a, a, dis, a situation you didn't like, uh, there's always something you could find that you did like and want to do. So we, we put up with them in the week, during the week, and a, then we'd go out in the country. But it really didn't bother me too much because most of the time I, I was gone. I was on a the first region uh, inspection team. You know, we checked the operation of different missile sites at the East Coast. And uh, so we flew. You know, we fly commercial air all the time. And uh, every week I'd be, it seems like, yes, if I tell it, every week I'd be gone. And I'd fly anywhere between uh, New York City to uh, Chicago. And and down to Key West, and, and we picked out where we were going, but we generally found the best places in town to eat, and then we go, oh, we'll go to that place, they got a good prime river or something like that, but anyway, we, we turned these trips into an advantage, too, and, uh, and er everything, I think that's what kept us going, you, you have to look at the bright side, I found in the service, probably like any job, hey, Jeremy, uh, there's bad days, and then most of the time it's good days. And you know, any 
any job. If you don't like a job, you, you want to quit, and if you stick with it, it turns out to be good and so forth. But that's what I found in the service. There, there were times when I, what am I doing here? And then other times, oh, I'm glad I'm here. Most of the time. What was Region 1? You said you were part of the Region 1 inspection team. What was Region 1? What did that include? Well, first region was in the, in the uh, district, so to speak, uh, along the east coast. And uh, we had a, a major general in charge of it. So it was a very, very big outfit. So when you went out to the, uh, oh, when, you, when you went on an inspection team, you represented the general. So you, had to, you really, you had to be uh, well, on your toes, really. You, you, of course, didn't want to embarrass the general because he didn't like any problems either. So it, I enjoyed the trips. And then, but I got to the point I didn't want to take any more, and since I retired, I haven't been on a plane since, and, I, and I'm not about to, but. Grandpa, what were some awards and medals that you received for your time what? in service? What were some awards or medals and ribbons that you received uh, during your time in World War II? Well, uh, I guess I got the Army Accommodation Medal when I retired for the work I did, and, and I got the Soldier's Medal, and I used to be kind of proud of that. That's the good conduct medal, and the only ones that would get that are enlisted men, and they were the warrant officer, and I'd have that thing stuck right up there. What's that? And I said, it's a good conduct medal, and he said, and he'd say, I never heard of that. I go, well, you're not qualified. You'd never make it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I, always, I enjoyed that. And, uh, and then, uh, let's see, I got Korean medal and the UN medal and the Korean presidential citation for the unit and uh, well there's, there's more but I can't, can't think of them. Yeah. Um, um, Grandpa, do you think you have contrib contributed a lot towards the Korean War? Do you think you have contributed any part of the Korean War of the efforts? That rival war. Uh, how do you feel of, tour, uh, that of you playing a role in the Korean War? How do you feel? Do you feel like you contributed a part at all? That you did your job? How do you feel as far as that? How do I feel? I can't really say I really don't. I really can't answer that. I, I really don't ever answer. I really enjoyed it. But. Okay, but I'd like to thank you guys for having me here. I enjoyed myself, and uh, we'll see you again. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Paul? Thank you, sir. Forget to take a few pictures.